<laughs> it's, it's Friday and that means it's Super Rugby time and Rugby AU. We've had the first round of the Aussie version and we're going great team. I think it's going to be the last round of the New Zealand one in terms of the first phase of it. So let's get stuck straight into it. Uh, Paul, uh, welcome weatherman. Listen, let's let's talk about the Aussie version quickly. Just, uh, just a, a wrap up of week one and specifically maybe how the rules stand out as well. What did you think of the first week's action from the Aussies? Yeah, well, look, we, we, we should have expected what we saw, really, which was basically that um, rusty sides not not uh, struggling with interpretations, uh, particularly down the breakdown, which led to a whole bunch of blowing the whistle. Uh, and so, uh, and cue the uh, Aussie people all complaining and moaning about referees blowing the whistle too much. You know what, guys? Calm it down. It'll calm down over the next couple of weeks as they get used to the new rules. It does mean quicker ball, um, which is good for rugby. You guys are supposed to like playing rugby. Um, you're not supposed to like this uh, this sort of one out driving it up stuff. So let uh, get quick ball, play some rugby, and enjoy it, folks. So uh, yeah, that was that, I think that, that was a big takeaway for me from week one. Um, I got it totally wrong um, about the Reds. I thought they would be in uh, a kind of a bit of disarray and lacking leadership and stuff. But um, hey, that's what the Waratahs showed us, didn't they? Oh yes. The, the, the cap goes sailing by. Deary me, deary me. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think we have week one. Um, was that's yeah, that, that that's what that's my summary of uh, um, of it. I, I you know, they tried it in one game. I mean, um, James O'Connor, um, he was he, he spent the whole first half trying to kick a 50 22, uh, didn't he? Uh, and didn't make it, didn't, didn't manage it. So, I mean, poor fella, poor fella. <laughs> Well, I tell you, Steve, I must say, we definitely saw the new laws in action. I know there was one one time where they were forced forced dead uh, and, and it ended up being a job goal where uh, a, a goal line job out instead of a five-meter scrum when I thought, obviously, you know, the Reds with a, with a strong back of forwards really could have pressed, pressed them an advantage. And then when it was really, really, you know, crunch time, McDermott kicked that one over the top of the, uh, the rack and went out and they got the line out back. So it definitely played a part. I wouldn't say it determined the winner of the game either way, but we, we saw it in action. And, and your thoughts on, on what went down this weekend in, in Australia? Um, I was quite entertained, as Paul said, of James O'Connor. I thought it was quite funny watching him trying to kick every single ball for uh, his own team's line out and then get completely uh, peeved off when Tate McDermott kicked that one first pop. Uh, just threw him completely off his game. He's just like threw his toys out of his cot and said, no, nah, I'm, I'm done, not doing any more. And that was it. That's the last scene of James O'Connor doing it. But yeah, it's it interesting. I think yeah, the, the goal line dropout sort of thing uh, uh, is a bit weird. The players were even confused by that, as we've seen in the games. Uh, I don't think that really works uh, in, in Union. But yeah, I think the whole kicking the 50-22s and 22-50s, although it's the same sort of thing, I do, it does have that uh, prospect to really change the game on its head in, in an instant. One good kick, you can go from defending your own line and then, hello, you're in the half with, with a decent attacking chance from your own set piece. So it changes the game. It, it adds a little bit more excitement. I guess you say if you really want to be desperate, look for positives. But the whole goal line dropout thing, yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of that at all. But, uh, yeah, it was interesting first week. I think we saw that big stark contrast between the Super Rugby Aotearoa and then the Super Rugby AU. And it, they weren't good following each other. I, I think Australia should just play all the games on Friday night. Just then it's done, you know, we can move on to the better rugby on Saturday and Sunday uh, and go from there. But interesting, good to see it back. But the problems aren't really over over there. So it's going to be interesting how the effects of, of all this ongoings with the with certain regions shutting down and things go on in the future. So, yeah, it's, it's a work in progress for the old, old Aussies. But, um, yeah, step in the right direction, at least. I think one thing also is that, look, for, the, for those decries, like, it won't be rugby anymore. Look, it's still pretty much the same game, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. feel massively different because of the rules, either uh, rules, experimental laws, either in Australia or New Zealand. Um, it's still pretty much the game we recognise um, and love to hate in some times, but uh, but love, yeah. Well, as as long as there's scrums and and uh, rally malls, I think we can definitely say it's uh, it, it it's rugby union. So that's that's all good. Uh, the strange thing is, I actually think we saw the Brumbies go for a few moves instead of that that strong strong mall of theirs, which was a, a little bit surprising. I don't know if they felt that there was uh, an interpretation difference which would stop them from being as uh, as dominant on that front. But just in in terms of the results, I mean, that's one thing that we did see that's that's pretty close to the New Zealand version. Is it was uh, tight games. It it looked um, 
both actually to be pretty one-sided uh, at, at one stage and it looked like one team would run away and then it ebbed and flowed again to to the other side so it looks like that could be uh you know a kind of theme just as it is in new zealand that it's going to be a tight affair but just on on the first week's results that go as you guys expected or uh, have you thought uh, as paul said that he was impressed by the reds uh, anything stand out in terms of the team performance or the brumbies uh the real deal and could we oh, just I, stop the tournament oh, and give them the trophy i wouldn't go i wouldn't go as far as saying i was impressed by the reds they just weren't as awful as i thought they were going to be <laughs> our titles were poor really poor um the um yeah look i mean the the i think what the brumbies have, have, have have realized and have been clever about is that they everyone expects them to to maul so what it means is that it ties in a whole bunch of players which means they, they can run other um plays off the back of that knowing that players are tied in so they're being clever about it which is nice to see actually seeing some clever rugby coming out of there probably um oh uh, i want to say laurie meeks but it's not is it um the, the guy who else, who wears a hat like mine um uh Fisher, Fisher, isn't it? Fisher. There we go, Laurie Fisher. Um, the uh, so yeah, probably his. Uh, it has his stamp of um, of coaching all over that. For for, for my mind, uh, so yeah, I I, I still think Brum. It, yeah, it's it's the Brumbies' tournament to lose. I mean, well, I, 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 I tell you, I, I tell you what, uh, Steve. I just want to go uh, when you've got uh, fellow of Inga in for first try score. You definitely don't want them trying uh, fancy moves. You just want them to stick what works. <laughs> Cornflake, uh, your thoughts. Yeah, well, I can say I perfectly earned myself the title of wearing this cap once again for another week. Uh, 10 out of 10 throughout the competition so far, 100%, nailing all the Super Brew leagues, just loving life at the top of the moment. So everything's going well for my predictions. I thought the Reds would be half decent. They didn't let me down. They put in a, a decent little nudge. The Waratahs are still the headless chickens that I keep calling them every single week. And they just seem to have very, very little bright light except for that young man in number 10, Will Harrison, who I think is, is going to be a good little player for them. But really, do you say he's got to move clubs because he doesn't have much um, sort of support in that sort of team. When you, you look through that Waratah side and you say, who played well? Who can I say that was a good knock from? And there's just not many names that really stood out and, and shone throughout that team. So... That was a disappointing thing from them. But yeah, the Reds, as I expected, I thought they played a pretty decent team, a uh, pretty decent game, fell asleep for a bit, as all the sides really did throughout. Um, but but held strong. I think the biggest positive for the Reds was that they actually showed a bit of grit when it come down to the end, but they normally completely collapsed because the other team, oh no, they've come back and it's getting close. We're going to completely lose our marbles. But they actually uh, showed a little bit of it and and got themselves over the line, which is positive, positive to see for them. And uh, yeah, the Brumbies, I think, I spoke about this game earlier in the week and I said, the Brumbies are the winners. They'll be disappointed. The Rebels are the losers and they'll probably be quite happy. Um, not very often that really happens, but I think that the Rebels and their forward play was actually decent enough uh, against a, a Brumbies team that, you know, like you've talked about already, are, are so forward dominated. So they'll be they'll be happy they can actually match it up in there. They made it close. No one's expecting them to do that. Um, so yeah, it made for a, a decent opening weekend and I think more surprises than we were probably expecting from the round. I think maybe let's uh, let's just finish up with the Australians and and go straight into straight into the preview of this week. Uh, as as you said there, Steve, the the performance of the Rebels forwards was was quite uh, impressive and maybe surprising. So this week, uh, Rebels and the Reds actually looks like quite a quite a decent matchup, and I think um, your Super Brew might be uh, a, a bit tough to pick this week. Yeah, you're not wrong about that. This is the first week I've probably really looked at it and gone, I, I really don't think I'm going to be keeping hold of that 100% record after this weekend. Yeah, you, you, the Rebels are kind of prepared a little bit, aren't they, for this one? Um, because they've played the Brumbies, who, who obviously that forward base side, and now they're going to play the Reds, who although are, are a different sort of forward base side, they still base themselves around that sort of style of play where they're going to be uh, big, uh, they're going to be trying to be powerful and then trying to, going to be intimidating in that sort of style of play. Uh, although they're going to be a bit more, I think, expansive and they're, they're going to try and um, get out into the other areas of the field rather than just around the pack of forwards uh, from set piece and things like that. So, you know, you can expect to see players like Taliana Tupo, you know, he's going to be out there on the sidelines trying to run over little wingers and things like that. So they've got a little bit more of that youthfulness, I guess you could say, that, that players can get around the field a bit more. So they're going to have to look out for that, the Rebels. Um, but I think the, the biggest thing that's going to wear this Rebels team down, maybe not this week, but it's the fact that they're home but not at home. Um, that's going to be a, a big a sore point for them. They're going to be on the road all the time. Neutral venues, away venues, and, and that's really going to be tough. But yeah, this weekend, 
yeah, I, I've struggled to pick it. And, and I, if I come away with another 100% record weekend, you know, I'm going to be gloating about it even more than I have for this whole season already. So you can count on that. Paul, uh, they're playing this one at the stadium, the NRL guys called Lotto Land. Do you think um, you're going to get lucky on the result in this one? Uh, which, uh, which way are you going there? Oh, I'm, I, you've, you've got to go with Rebels, for my mind. Um, but but you do have to wonder what's um, what's going on in there in in some of the commentators uh, and also Vessel's head. So I mean, last last week when they're running through the, um, the 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 teams, one of the commentators said, "Oh, Kellaway, the man in form." You're like, he hasn't played a game in three months. How do you know he's in form? Um, and uh, that seems to be catching because Vessel's has gone and said now. Um, that uh, Campbell is obviously coming back from a long um, injury layoff and Hodgie has had some injuries back before the break. So it's probably just more a case of managing both their loads. Um, they've they've both had a huge workload over the last couple of weeks. They've only had one round of games. How can they have had a huge workload over the last couple of weeks for crying out loud? They've played one game and they're already managing workloads. Um, so yeah, I, I do wonder about the mental state of the commentators and, and coaches as to, as to understanding what the hell's going on in their country. But um, no big surprise there. Uh, yeah, the, the, the Rebels should just have too much class for the um, for the Reds, in my mind. The, 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 what's narrowed it down to three for me is that, look, the Rebels aren't actually at home. They're having to stay away from home. Um, have, did they bring enough clothes with them to survive um, this couple of weeks? That, um, or are they, are, they, are, are they having to turn their knickers inside out and to wear them twice before sending them down to get washed? Uh, just, yeah, that... that Kind of lack of that that kind of change can can unsettle some players. Um, so hence, I'm still going the rebels, but not by a large margin. It, it feels like I'm saying this every week, but uh, Paul driving Mall, thanks so much for joining us this season, and we won't be seeing you again after attacking <laughs> the only South African involved in the Australian version. Dave Vessels, thanks so much, bud. Uh, we enjoyed it, um, Paul. Since it's your last week, uh, let's keep you going there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to the Waratahs that you uh, obviously are also a very big fan of. Um, <laughs> their, their game against the returning force, the, uh, the only team representing the whole western side of Australia. Do you expect, uh, you told me that they that they know the rules, that they well practiced having played the Malaysian Falker or some obnoxious team like that. Uh, what are you expecting Hang from, on a second. from this game? You're having a go at me attacking South African teams. The Malaysian Volker obviously paired up with a South African province. You, oh, dearie me. The wonderful well, for, the record, for the record, it's it's not one of our strongest provinces to start off with. And now it's an affiliate. So I don't know about that. But OK. <laughs> um, look, uh, the, the, the this again, I've gone Waratahs by three. I mean, look, we've not seen the force against any true opposition in a couple of years now. Let's be honest. They've been playing a whole bunch of other teams uh, when they... When uh, this team does not bear any resemblance to the side that last was in Super Rugby, um, and you look, you're looking through that list, and if if you haven't um, watched any Global Rapid Rugby, you're looking through that list, going, "Who are these guys?" Um, now they've brought back a couple of players like John O'Lance, um, which um, which will help uh, add, add add a bit of um, uh, a bit of class, a bit of game, a uh, bit of game management for them. But at the end of the day, they should not be challenging a team that's got wallabies in them okay that's what it comes down to but then again this wallabies this this waratah's side are very good at being a lot worse than the sum of the parts um so they just don't like playing with each other by the sounds of things um look i mean they've they've got well they've got internationals throughout them playing a bunch of names that you don't recognize you've got to say the the the, the tars should win this one but the tars just yeah as i say just don't add up to, to to the skill they've got, um, and uh, you, you. So hence, again, another one I think is going to be very close, uh, but I'm going with the home side. I think I think the Western Force have been smart. Yeah, they've they've put Carl Godwin on the on the bench just to make it appear like they've got a heck of a lot of depth because this I can't even make the starting lineup. But um, I won't. I don't think I'm going to be fooled by that one. Steve, uh, your expectations of the Force back in the competition and and what the Waratahs can can bring to this game. Well, I do agree with what uh, Paul says about the Waratahs. Um, yeah, they have the potential to be the worst team in the competition, and they have the potential to be somewhat okay on, on their day. But what I can't agree with them um, is about the Western Force. I mean, this Western Force team has a Super Rugby experience spine. 
straight through the middle. Uh, if you've not heard of Kieran Longbottom, Jeremy Thrush, Henry Stowers, Bernard Stander, Ian Pryor, John O'Lance, Marcel Braki, uh, Andrew Reddy, Chris Heiberg, Greg Holmes, Johan Bardal, and Kyle Godwin, then I don't know what rugby you've been watching. Maybe, maybe you're saying over in the Northern Hemisphere because those are all names that have been playing domestically um, in Super Rugby in Australia and in New Zealand for some of them as well. So that's a, that's a good spine when you compare it to the Waratahs who... Yeah, they've got a lot of international players, but they similarly have a lot of those unknown guys throughout that team. Yeah, they've got that spine of players, but in that sort of regard, I find them very, very similar sort of teams. And I found this force team quite impressive to look upon because many people have looked at this team and coming back in the Super Rugby, and it's very easy for people to look at it and go, oh, you know, they're coming back, you know, they're just going to pick up all the scraps that all the other teams don't want to have and just, you know, amble their way through and pretend to be the Sun Wolves in blue. That, that's not going to happen. That It's absolute garbage. This team has been pretty well fine-tuned in their competition. So their continuity and the way they play with each other is going to be a lot better than many people are going to be expecting. I, I fully believe this team is going to give the Waratahs a really, really big run for their money. Because like Paul says, the Waratahs have a great ability to make themselves seem like the underdog in any sort of matchup that they're in. And they just come from behind. And sometimes they do steal that win. But that's going to be the same circumstance here against the force. I think they're going to push them all the way. But I do agree with them in the final state that I think the Waratahs will just have a little bit too much um, in the end to get that job done uh, against the force. But you talk about those players, and, and quite a few of them weren't part of the uh, – have very recently joined up with them. So uh, John O'Lance was over in the UK playing for Worcester Warriors. Um the uh, a couple of guys on the bench again uh, were over in the UK, uh, over in the UK or UK or Ireland. So they've not had time to play with those other players who have played a lot together. Um, and I, yeah, I, I just think that that maybe you've got a a spine uh, and a bunch of bones that aren't actually attached to the spine, who are thinking a different thing. Sorry, a, a spine with a bunch of uh, muscles um, not attached to the not attached to the um, the bones uh, that are thinking a different thing. So it could be disjointed there uh, for this 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 force. Like, look. I would love the force to win this game. Absolutely love the force to win. This game. I want the force to win this game. I'm cheering on the force. I just, um, I, yeah, I just can't see it. You've got to remember this is a rugby show and and not a health or, or fitness show. That's a good thing, at least. Um, you say that, but remember, a lot of these guys are ex-force players as well. So they have already been in this sort of environment. So they're coming back home, as it essentially was, which is awesome to see and shows that the force actually do have a bit of pull with their weight so they can get these guys back, these guys that are, you know, internationals or at a high level standard player because they were still there. Imagine if they could have stolen all their players back from the Rebels. Now, then we would have got a bit of a rivalry going. Now, also, I mean, there is one good thing here. These guys haven't had to take a pay cut, right? So they're not going to be, uh, they're not going to be dispirited and pissed off with their management in the same way that all the other Australian teams will be. Um, so maybe that will pull them together. Um, I'm, I'm scratching here around here. I really would love the force to win. Yep. Uh, I don't know, guys. You've made a lot of punters very happy because everyone's been saying uh, back back this underdog Western Force team. To me, this it's a spine of a dinosaur, so I don't know what, what spine we're talking about. Yeah. We've got Simmons and we've got Hooper on the other side. We've got uh, Mark on the wing, youngster, who's just going to be scoring a hat-trick this weekend. They're playing at the SCG. This is a part-time bowler bowling off-tracks to Steve Smith. If uh, if the Waratahs do do lose, it's because they they headed to the man on the fence and got caught out. It's it's a hundred percent in the Waratahs' hands. Yeah, if they pitch up in one of those moods where they just don't, you know, they they're disinterested and they can't get going, then then the force are going to steal this win, and that's the only way they're going to do it. They're going to they're going to stumble their way into a surprise victory. Yeah, but to me, if the Waratahs can play at eighty percent of their performance, they've got one week under their belts under the new laws and. The force are coming in cold. They're probably coming in cold of like four or five years of Super Rugby. So that's very cold. It's going to take more than one week of uh, getting getting rid of the rust. So now I'm not I'm not uh, in in the same confident mood that you guys are. I don't have anything against the force, and the Tars have cost me a heck of a lot of money over the years. But I'm going I'm going to the well once again, and uh, uh, Tars Tars to win this one with some room to spare. Then uh, if we can move on to the to the to the proper stuff. Uh, listen, uh, Steve, we know you've been um, doing well on Super Blue, but let's get stuck straight into it. Uh, I don't care how they got there, but your boys took a 20-pointer. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit rough, wasn't it? It, it was a bit rough, uh, fully undeserved. Um, there was plenty of tears. There was plenty of disappointment. But hey, 
it's the Crusaders. And I mean, if you can stick with the Crusaders right to the very end, uh, be six points away and throw everything, including the kitchen sink, uh, the bench top, the tapware, the sugar, the whole lot at them, and you just about do it. You just about come away after cookies, and then it all falls to pieces, and you just get slammed at the end. I mean, you can't fault the effort. I mean, remember, this is the Crusaders. Um, and that was, I think, an amazing, valiant effort uh, against them last weekend. So, I mean, as a fan, you got to be proud of that effort. I mean, everyone likes to see the team that's not the big favourite uh, at least give it their 100%, give it their all. And to, like I say, to be there right at the end, to be within that chance of one scoring play to take that win and steal that win, which would have been a, a massive boil over, uh, I thought it was quite tenacious of them. So nothing but impressed, but we all saw it coming, didn't we? Paul, uh, imagine throwing the kitchen sink, giving 100%, being proud of your team and losing by 20. Um, so <laughs> what what you thought uh, from that game? For me, look, this is a team, I think what we're seeing here is a Crusaders team that takes its foot off the throat um, and doesn't doesn't really apply it. I mean, to get up um, and to, um, to, to uh, down at halftime, then you, suddenly they, they come back, they get, the, they get the scores, they get the lead, but they let the... Uh, let the Highlanders back in. They don't sort of pull away like you'd expect this Crusaders team to do in years past. To me, that yeah, it's, that, I think that's the story here. Yeah, two two late tries made the, made the score blow out. Um, but to me, it wasn't a twenty point game. When you think that, um, yeah, the Highlanders were were basically chasing the game at that point. Uh, yeah, and did some things they shouldn't do, uh, which gave away a couple of soft soft tries. So I think that. Um, that yeah, it was closer than it was. I think we're seeing a side, a Crusader side here that isn't as isn't as clinical um, as we've seen in uh, in seasons past, uh, and that might come to bite them at some point. But at the moment, they've got enough that they and they know how to win, so they're getting themselves over the line. But um, but they're leaving it late. What I relate this game to was kind of like to use a football analogy. You know, it's it's the after the 85th minute, you're down by a goal. What do you do? You throw the wing backs forward. You throw the defender. You leave one man back, one man in the keeper. You just throw everything at there. I think that's what the Highlanders really did. That bomb try, I think, was the huge turning point. But after that, they still, you know, threw everything at there. They got caught massively on the counter. You know, the old fast strikers come back the other way and there was no chance for the, the slobby defender at the back. So they gave it that, that shot. And I think that's that's a counteract. They could have probably sat back, I think, and tried to defend a losing bonus point or something like that. But, you know, that's just not Highlanders rugby. I guess that's not New Zealand rugby either. You, you go for the gauntlet, they go for the win. Um, and, yeah, that was that was the, the flip side of it when it goes wrong. Uh, 100%. And I think there's no better team at, at putting a team away or, or taking an opportunity like that, even though... Uh, uh, driving mall is is right. They might not be at, as ruthless, but geez, on a, on a counter attack, as you say, they they definitely that football team that can hit you on a counter. Um, Paul, onto onto the other game. Is this uh, a season of misery? Is there going to be some pressure on uh, on on Gatlin with this uh, uh, Chiefs season? After pretty much everyone was expecting them to be the ones to push the Crusaders all the way this season. Well, it's going to be interesting, is it? Because he's not here next year. He's off to do the Lions. Um, and um, the, uh, the 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 current Bay of Plenty um, head coach is coming in instead. So if he comes in and suddenly wins Super Rugby, then oh, that'll be interesting. Do you do you ditch a winning coach and bring back Gatland, or does um, or do you uh, yeah, or, or or do you ditch Gatland, who's considered be, who, who a lot of people consider to be one of the best coaches in the world? So um, will there be pressure after this? I don't think so. I think he'll be. Uh, it, because he's, he's disappearing off, people will kind of it'll it'll sort of dissipate, um, and then that's when he is he's, he's a Waikato boy um, from from way back. So I think he's got a lot of a lot of credit in the bank um, that'll see him through this. But um, yeah, it's uh, it, it it'll be interesting if, um, as I say, if uh, if the Bay of Plenty head coach wins it next year, that 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 would uh, definitely put the cats amongst the pigeons. Don't worry, he's gonna he's gonna come back with more pressure after the Springboks beat them 3-0, the British and Irish Lions. So it's gonna be pressure all over. Um, Steve, your thoughts there on on the the Chiefs at the moment? Uh, concern, um, hospitals, lots of words like that. Uh, it's been the same story all season long, hasn't it? Not much has really changed. They're struggling in the pack. They're still struggling against the Hurricanes. Um, nothing much went right for them. They don't get the best out of the players, which, you know, they've got the good players. I just don't know if, if maybe the, the senior players in this team are trying to do too much by themselves. They're not playing it as a unit, as a squad. 
uh, or just what what is going on uh, with this team. But they're certainly uh, not really at the races, are they? Except for maybe they got a little bit of hope up near the end of that matchup uh, against the Canes that was you know quickly shut down when, when things got serious. So yeah, bit a bit of a concern I think all around for for this team. Where does where do they go from here? That, that's the big question. I mean, they have to find something. They have to find some reason to mo- to to motivate them. Some reason to get up for the next game because it's just going to get harder and harder. Like we said at the start of the season, there's no easy games here. There's there's no easy you know fly off and and face you know, the Australian teams or the, the Sunwolves or, or whatever over there. So they the don't get that little break. Or who? The Bulls. <laughs> just well, to... <laughs> I was going to say when the South African teams come here, but I thought I'd, I'd stop one short of that. You know, we all know how much the Storm is like coming here and defending crossfield kicks. So, yeah, that's that's what they don't have on their side. So it's a bit of a struggle. And I mean, what have they got to lose now? It's time to probably throw at everyone out, find out what these guys are made of, find out what the, the squad has in the locker uh, for the rest of the season, and, and you know, prepare for the future. Look, I, I think it'd be a little bit harsh here. I think um, against the Crusaders, they lost because they. They they um they basically fell asleep uh, and and were not paying attention, which meant they had that quick line out try. In this one, the game was essentially lost in two minutes at the end of the first half, where they suddenly went from being three ten down to being three twenty down, um, and they were never coming back from that. Uh, this team just 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 can't. This team just switches off too often. Uh, if they get that concentration right, then at least they'll be competitive. That I, mean, I say I'm not saying say they'll turn around and start winning games, but at least they'll be competitive. They that that's that's the first step is concentrating for a full eighty because at the moment they're going to sleep and giving away um, easy points. What I find they don't have though is they don't have someone that really dictates their their play or their pace of the game. That's why they don't seem to have a, a high tempo game or a, a slow. T- it's kind of like they're just monotone the whole way through. Uh, when they you know like against Canes or against the Crusaders when they start to get close and normal teams the confidence goes up they start to run a bit faster they start to hit a bit harder they start to get that you know build up of momentum and confidence in the team they just don't seem to get that they don't they'd be down by 20 points they're playing the same as if they're down by a point they don't have that enthusiasm that pickup and it's bizarre because I would expect someone like a, a Cruden you know to really amp up the back line with his leadership or or the spark of Brad Webber's been average so far this season, but he's a player that can spark a team. They just are lacking that spark and that that next gear or that that next bit of momentum to to push them forward and actually get over that next hurdle that they could possibly push a team or ultimately get a victory. Well, I'll tell you what, I think when when they do struggle and and fall behind, it's it's like Damien Damien McKenzie tries to go to this next level, but it's almost like he ends up spinning his wheels where he's trying too much. You know, it's it's almost over elaborate from him and it and it just compiles the error. So it's it's not great and it's actually gonna be a an interesting thing for you guys. I don't know, maybe let's uh, have a quick chat. We've we've gone quite quickly. Uh just uh, where we are at the moment and we we're pretty much halfway in, in the competition, your your thoughts on on the fullback situation at present? I mean, everyone and his dog is uh, selecting um, Will Jordan to to be the the man to take over and probably fill like a Ben Smith kind of shoes. Obviously, D Mac is back from injury, and and then you've got Jordan popping them over from uh, Jordy popping them over from sixty meters, and and you just saw saw the big influence he had when he came back for the Hurricanes this week. So, uh, and and obviously the most underrated probably man, especially if you're a Crusader. David Avili, who can slot in any time. So your your thoughts, guys, on, on that fullback position in, in the All Black setup, who's uh, first choice and who's probably going to be like a, a bench cover in that situation? Uh, Paul, I'll start you off. Um, it's, it's all going to come up, come down to what is um, uh, Ian Foster wanting to do with, with um, Bowden Barrett and does he want to continue this two-playmaker piece? If he wants to continue the two-playmaker piece, I think it's Bowden Barrett at 10 and David McKenzie at 15. Um, and let Dave McKenzie play himself back into form, because that's uh, that, that, that's kind of when, when Dave McKenzie got injured, that totally threw out the balance of the squad and everything for for that um, for the All Blacks. And I think that's what they want. That, that that's what what he wants to see. So so that's what I would um, suggest. He wants to go to the two playmakers, but thinks Richard Mwang is the guy. Then you might see Bowden Barrett at fifteen, and all those three, all those players you just talked about, not even getting anywhere in the matchday squad. Um, so I have to. It, it it depends on on what style of play he's looking for. Um, I think that's going to really hurt your Jordy uh, and Will Jordan. I mean, David Avili is not even going to be in the not even going to be in the extended squad to be honest. Um, but so it's going to that's it's going to help, help hurt those two guys because they're more 
fullbacks rather than uh, playmaking fullbacks that you've that um, that they want to play, so they can play uh, either way off a ruck, off, off a midfield ruck. So it's going to come down to that style of play. If they actually want a proper, if they want a proper defender, a proper fullback, then I think Geordie's the man. But I think they want, I think they want to go for that two playmaker thing. So I think it'll be Damon McKenzie. If I want to add to what Paul said, which I agree with what he said 100 percent there, it also comes down to the wingers. Because we know the All Blacks have this terrible, terrible habit of playing Jordy Barrett on the wing, playing those sort of guys on the wing, which aren't, well, they're not wingers, at least be fair. I mean, they play them as wingers that pretty much play probably more at fullback than they do on the wing. So I think that's probably where, like a Will Jordan, I think he's going to get in his squad if he keeps his form up in some capacity, probably not to play, but they like to get these young guys into that environment, see what sort of personality they have, what, you know, if they fit in with the culture, all that sort of dribble. That's probably where he's going to fit in somewhere. Maybe he'll play a little, who knows what they're even going to play, uh, let alone if he would play, but that's where he's going to fit into that squad somewhere, I do think. But his versatility as well, as a guy who could probably be a bit more suited to the wing than like a Jordy Barrett sort of thing would be like, I, I can't stand Barrett on the wing absolute waste. He, he's he's like a Waratah when he's out there. Just no clue what's going on whatsoever. At fullback, he, he's determined. He's, he's just, he's a fighter. And his defensive abilities just incredibly increase. Uh, and his boot is a massive asset. He just has a lot of things going for him at fullback. So I really like him at the back there. But yeah, like Paul says, just adding on to that, it's going to come down to who plays 10. Uh, that will result. It, it's pretty much rotates around Bowden Barrett. Effectively, it's where does Bowden Barrett play? then you pick your team around the outside of that. That's what it's going to come down to. Now, the, the thing that's different now than previously, potentially, is uh, so, so previously the, the, the right winger has been a has been a fullback. Um, so you've had two fullbacks. Now, if you play Bowden Barrett and Dave McKenzie, you have two fullbacks. And basically, you know, if you look at how the Blues defend, um, you'll see that actually uh, a Terry Black defends um, as, as the right fullback uh, and Bowden Barrett defends as the left fullback defensively and they don't have a playmaker in the line defensively at all so that means you can play two if so if you play Bowden and um Dane McKenzie potentially you can actually play two proper wingers rather than a winger and a fullback um, which is what they've done historically just just in terms of that uh, tactic I was actually talking talking to someone on social media this week and that's exactly the the point we had it is your your 14 often I mean to me, the the worst decision ever was playing Ben Smith as fourteen. To me, is just mm -hmm. just not a, a right winger. So it was crazy. But is it is it completely is is it two ways tactical kicking uh, or as you said to just accommodate the, the the second playmaker or is it high ball as well or, or what exactly do you think is the the real decision behind playing a fourteen? Because in in my view, you know, Sibu is is pretty bloody good at under the high ball. So it's not like he he doesn't have a high ball skill you know his handling is, is is pretty good so i couldn't see that you know someone would be much better than him in terms of the high ball but obviously if you're talking about tactical kicking then definitely it's not like he's got uh, much of a boot to talk about uh, i don't know what what do you guys think is the reason for that uh, right wing position being a second fullback go for high ball you are a fullback expert um high ball it's about, yeah especially especially with the I mean, with, with more and more box kicking you have your, your your wingers especially your right winger has to be able to to, to cope with that high ball um and so yeah that's it, it, it's it's it is around it's it's around high ball um Silver Reese might be decent under the high ball but he's not very tall um and uh, so yeah so he can get out jumped um now you can say the same about Dave McKenzie as well to be fair he's not the tallest guy but um but that that yeah that's why you've had your, your Ben Smith before him Corey Jane uh, your name on the scudder's also been a fullback out there. Um, I'm trying, but I mean, Naholo was the big uh, anomaly on 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 the on the right wing. But you, um, um, but yeah, there's been quite a few guys. For it's not just been Ben Smith. I mean, Israel Dag also played out there as well. So it's been it's been, it's been a long time now. I think probably since about 2011 um, was when they started doing it. As as you say, I mean, it's it's going to be so strange after the guys I mentioned. Do you think that uh, none of them will probably be starting, and and you could be going for Bowden Barrett? I mean, that's that's just weird. And again, you're also one of the weird sides. You'll have one of the best flyers in world rugby playing fullback. So yeah, those are the the strange uh, things about uh, all black rugby. But somehow it always works. And it's actually let's let's go on to to this week. 
now seeing the the whole team news in terms of Scott Robinson, it's a case of how he's going to accommodate all his black uh, his back three uh, options. So uh, Steve is gone this week for putting the in four man on the bench. Yeah, so Will Jordan misses out, which has shocked everyone to a massive surprise. But I mean, yeah, we've we've seen this coming, didn't we? That over the last couple of weeks, they have done quite a few changes. It, it, it's tough. I mean, he's probably the four man of the competition so far, the one that's getting all the headlines. But this is what the Crusaders do well. They have all these players. They rotate them. They're all match ready. They're all match fit. They're all ready to go. And they've all played minutes as well. So they're all at that peak level. If he, Havili breaks his leg tomorrow, which is well, on Saturday, which is you know probably quite likely in his injury history, they've got a guy that just slots straight back in. They've, they've got those guys there. And it just, it's, it's, it's kind of unfair, isn't it? They've got this wealth of talent. It's like, hmm, do we leave out George Bridge, Sevi Reese, David Harvey, or Will Jordan this weekend? Oh, that's a tough call. What team in the world has that kind of problem? You know, most of the team, uh, you know, th th those sort of positions, first names on the team sheet. I mean, look at who they're up against. It's pretty easy who's going to play in those outside backs positions. They, they kind of pick themselves. But, yeah, much like the Chiefs, though, they're going through the injury uh, process in the back row, aren't they? They're getting big hammerings um, in their forward pack. So we, we've got the double Toms this week as well, another change. So Tom Sanders and Tom Christie will be at six and seven uh, for the Crusaders, which will be another change. But, I mean, it doesn't make a difference, does it? They've, they've had, I think, it's about every round bar, bar um, well, is it every round? Probably they've had a change in that second row. Just about. So that's, I mean, in the in the back row. Sorry. So that's just how they go, and and they just keep, they just keep playing the process, and you don't even notice that it's a different player in that jersey. Paul, uh, Steve's done a good job of talking up the Crusaders there. So I'm going to leave it to you to handle the Blues. Uh, what are the positives oh. there in that team, and so how they can how they can tackle it? I thought you were going to ask me to to to, to show you where where the weakness in the uh, the Crusaders was, huh. um, but uh, but but now I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll move on to the yeah look in the Blues again. Um, one, only one sort of, um, oh, sorry, two changes really, uh, that, that have come in the back line, uh, Finley Christie in for Ruru, um, and the real surprise, Harry Plummer, um, coming in for, um, uh, for TJ Fiani. Now, TJ Fiani, um, has been the guy, has, has been the, 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 the linchpin for all the other players to play well around him, um, for the last couple of seasons yeah, for the Blues and also for, for, for Auckland in the minus 10. So i um, real surprised that TJ Payani, the unsung hero, has been dropped with um, Harry Plummer coming in. Um, Harry Plummer, I think a lot of us see, have, have seen him play a lot more at 10 or 15 than 12. Um, he is a tall tall guy, but um, yeah, I would be, yeah, I'd be running players at him all day uh, and just seeing whether he gets his, whether, whether he gets his spacing right Um uh, yeah, I think, I think there's there's definitely opportunities there. So that's going to be a big problem. But um, it's the big Boshes, isn't it? Um, Akiriwani, Hoskins to Tutu, um, with uh, Dalton Papalihi helping them out. That's where, and, um, and Patrick um, Tupolotu, um, those say that, that four, six and eight, carrying the ball and bashing over that gain line has got to be the, it's, it's got to be what, what we're looking for to set the platform to allow some really, really uh, dangerous backs then to attack. Um, and uh, it's interesting. Hoskins Satuta used to play on the wing. Um, he kicked the ball the other weekend, so he's, he's got a, he's got a kicking game as well. So he really, so there's there's an option there for for to um, you can pass it to him, pull up the wingers, kick in behind them. Um, there we go. So so uh, look at that extra extra kicking option there for the for the Blues. Um, but yeah, settled side. Uh, had a week off, so they'll be fresh. Um, to be fair, the Crusaders did rotate a bunch of people, so they'll be fairly fresh too. Uh, but I, you know, it should be a cracking game. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Goodness me, Paul. Start. They've already got three first fives in this team. What? <laughs> yeah, let, let's give it to Satutu to do the kicking instead. Don't worry about all <laughs> Teddy Black, Harry Plummer, Bowden Barrett. We'll give it instead to Hoskins Satutu to do the kicking. What are the Blues thinking? <laughs> my, my look at this mindset here is they're going into this game, they're like, well, according to the driving more predictions, it's going to be raining down in Christchurch. So we're going to go for just a 100% kicking game. If it comes down on the rucks, kick it. If we're not near 22, kick it. Kick it, kick it, kick it. There's everyone in this team can kick. Even Hoskins, you can kick. Akira, we've seen you do a chip and chase awfully once or twice before. Just give it a nudge, son. You'll be right. What are they thinking here? They're just going with the whole 100% kick. Harry Plummer, he's going to get one charge down kick, and he's just going to go... All over the floor like he has last season for the Blues. 
he is going to be oh, a massive chink in this whole Blues backline. Why would you drop Fayani if they survive the opening 40 minutes and are still in this game and then can bring Fayani on? Maybe they'll still be in it for chance, but goodness me, Goodhue's going to have a field day out there in or in Goodhue. Strapped in Harry Plummer. Just good night. Uh, but you know, you, you are right. This Blues team is not playing in their own half. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> one one phase to get a nice better a better angle to kick and boom off it goes yeah this this blues team is not play is not yeah definitely not the and the other argument is that you're playing two uh with 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 black and then plumber at 12 you're playing two guys um who should be able to spin it wide quickly so the other option is and i i'm, I'm i am gr grasping at straws here I, i'm expecting harry plumber to kick not to pass but you, yeah, you could see them as distributors and the idea is look get it into caleb clark's get it into mark talia's hands as wide as quickly as possible um, is the other option. So that you you might see that as a kind of uh, there's a um, if they if they do see that the, the, the Crusaders are dropping, then you might see that to just to, to, to if they might they might see that to try and spin it wide to get round them. Um, but don't expect that in the first twenty minutes. Definitely no. This is yeah, boot to ball, kick kick the leather off it, and make the Crusaders come back um, uh, score from eighty meters. The most bizarre thing about this whole tactic. If the Blues were 0-4 or 1-3 or, or something like that, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Cool, go for it. But they're undefeated so far. It ain't broke. You know, the old woman cliche saying, don't fix it. Why not play that natural game that they've been doing all season long? They're obviously doing it well. It's obviously working. Just keep doing it. This is your big test. This is the test of the competition so far for Blues. And they've just changed their whole look of that back line and – I think, like you say, how they're going to play. It's like they're going out for week one all over again, albeit against the Crusaders, which is, you know, that's, that's no one's week one that they want to go see. I was going to say, I don't know about listening to Paul's preview. I think they might have just watched the first week of the Australian competition and thought there was the kicking rule was in place in New Zealand <laughs> as well because they've decided they're just going to win the lineouts back by kicking out of their own half. So maybe after 20 minutes, they realise this isn't working. But no, I... Uh, um, Paul as well, maybe on, on the one side, I know he's there for his tactical kicking, but at the same time, it's not like Plummer's going to park the ball under his arm and have a go. So when he does decide not to kick, he's just going to give it. So maybe it could be a case of getting it to Rico a little bit more rather than TJ who also wants to have a little bit of a go first. So uh, maybe it could be getting getting the you know the opposite effect and getting more ball into the hand of uh, Caleb Clark and Rico Iwani, who are two devastating runners. So let's let's see. Uh, I don't. Yeah, if if the rain doesn't pitch up, then hopefully they decide to 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 give it to give it to the wings. <laughs> no, no. We're looking. At, we're, look, we're looking at it's 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 it's, it's going to be a dry night. Okay. In other words, it's going to be pressing down. <laughs> look, it's, it's it's forecast to be dry. Um, it, it's a sellout crowd, uh, which yeah. is fantastic. So it should be good atmosphere. It should be good. Yeah. Maybe 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 put plumber has been brought in as a distributing twelve rather than the kicking twelve. Maybe we're wrong, um, which would be and, – and if they do start running it from everywhere, oh, boy, oh, boy, that'll be fun. Because that back four with Rico Iwani, Bowden Barrett, Caleb Clark, and Talia, boy, those guys can – yeah, they could cut cut any team to pieces. So um, that would be fantastic to see. We just don't trust them to do it, do we? Let's be honest. Um, but I, I, can't see the, I, I can't see the Crusaders wanting to play too much in their own half. Um, unless they, I mean, if they spot an opportunity and a mismatch and a gap, they'll go clearly. Uh, but I think, yeah, I, I think the first five, 10 minutes, we'll see both teams deciding, look, we want to play in your half. We don't want to mess around our own halves. Well, I must say to me, the, the interesting thing, I think Richie Muanga is starting to really lift his game to a, to a pretty, pretty good level at the moment, which is a, a serious worry for the Blues. And the same, uh, I think he's probably... Okay, it's easy saying it now because no one's playing rugby, but he's the he's the best hooker in world rugby at the moment, Cody Taylor. I think he's got a complete game. He's stolen a little bit of a page from Dane Coles about uh, playing a little bit loose and wider, but at least he goes in and does his proper job as well. So to me, and, and geez, he's got some skills there. That we saw if that flick on and, and that kind of thing. So now I love to see those guys in, in action and hopefully it is try and and, and we see a, see a good game in that one. Um, another one that's going to really test the, the the predicting skills of of the man on on my right here on the screen, 
let's uh, go straight to him for for his his big clash. Obviously, if you look at these, uh, we we said the last two weeks uh, the Islanders came seriously close. They probably could have settled for a draw against the Blues, and they didn't. They went for that uh, jugular, as as Cornflake said, and and it didn't quite pay off for them last week. They were seriously unlucky. I mean, it wasn't a true affliction, as they said. If Nariki gave that ball and Moanga didn't make a great tackle as well. It could have been a different story, and at least it would have been very tight of ten to go. Steve, uh, on on paper, you have to think that the Islands are actually in with a in with a shout of winning this one. Oh, hundred percent in with the shout. Yeah, no problem at all. They are definitely in the running to win this game. Uh, similar records with the with each other. Uh, both the one win uh, and the and the two losses from the game so far, but contrasting results contrasting sort of styles of play and I think contrasting ways of adapting uh, to the way the game is played now here in New Zealand so that's certainly got a, I think advantage to the Highlanders they're on the road which is obviously not playing in, in the nice Forsyth Bar Stadium is going to be a bit of a downer for them but they are playing a much more exciting style of rugby they are up there with the top two in terms of how they're playing and, and how they're getting their game going but not quite as clinical as the Blues and the Crusaders are doing, as we've seen the last two weeks. On top of that, they have just played the Blues and the Crusaders. So they are really up, you know, getting beaten by the good teams, whereas the Hurricanes, on the other hand, coming off the Chiefs in a bit of a dangerous sort of matchup. So different levels is where they're coming from as well. Um, The Crusaders, sorry, the Highlanders will be, Oh, bitterly disappointed with how they finish off that game against the Crusaders. Uh, they'll be having a point to prove, I think, and they, they should come out of the guns uh, with the guns blazing in this one against the Hurricanes. They have lost um, their big man in the second row, so there's no place um, for Josh Dixon. He's out, and they've got uh, Jack Wenton coming in to replace them in that second row. So that's going to be, I think, a, a good, able replacement, a similar replacement, obviously not as um, experience throughout the season as uh, as Dixon was, but stood a similar sort of player that should fill that role, I think, quite decently when the appearances he's had so far. But as we were talking about just before, on the right wing, they've gone with the man who had the mare against the Blues. Uh, Scott Gregory's back. He's not a full back, but he's back, and he's back on the right-hand side uh, of the field. So how he responds is going to be just huge, but I think the Highlanders certainly are up there, one of the most exciting-looking teams at the moment, they're playing with the passion. They're playing for the excitement. And I think there's a there's a real clear divide, one and two, three at the Highlanders by far. And I think they should get the job against, you know, the four and the five, the Chiefs and the Hurricanes, or other way around, I should say, uh, down the bottom of the table. Despite despite the location, uh, despite Paul's weather forecast, the Highlanders are going to play. And then Shannon Frizzell. I, I have to mention Shannon Frizzell. Massive, massive, massive performances over the last two weeks. He is going to be key because... We know what they're going to bring on the other side, the likes of Adi Salvia. That clash, although it's it's six and an eight, is going to be huge. So two vital, vital parts to both of these two teams in a big, big clash. And I think Frizzell has you know, really just added to what is immense depth in New Zealand in that back row. So more from him, um, and that, that just is going to be a huge clash. He can lead the Highlanders forward from the front. Listen, uh, you guys, you guys must just please um, send me some some names and email addresses of guys I could use next week because I think uh, if the if the Hurricanes do put 20, 20 on Cornflake, he might not want to be, and obviously we've already banned Paul, so I'm gonna have to need new. Maybe I'll get some Aussies in. Paul, <laughs> you are scraping the bottom of the barrel, aren't you? Um, the um, so so six two bench here from the from the Highlanders. I think it tells you what's going to happen here. Look, it's going to be a very, very windy game, right? So uh, depending which direction it's from, you could be playing into the wind for one half, in which case that's why they're going for the 6-2 bench because they're going to be, you are going to have to play. You have to, you're going to have to play out your own half um, for one and a half. You can't just kick it uh, like, like we'll see the Chiefs, sorry, like, sorry, like the Blues and the Crusaders do to, to, to get out of their own halves. You're going to have to play out your own half. Um, so yeah, players like Frizzell, who's back into some of his best form, uh, and um, Aaron Smith, who's really playing well at the moment as well. As well. Um, yeah, I'm expecting this to the uh, yeah the, the, the Highlanders, as as Conflict said, are 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 playing well, and and McKinney too as well. Expect all those guys to be carrying it out. Um, on the flip side, looking at the uh, the the Hurricane selections, some some real head scratchers here. To be honest with you. Um, uh, um, Amua um, starting at two. Uh, Dane Cole's not even in the. Um, He's injured. Uh, not even in the. In, is, is, he, is he injured? Oh, okay. There you go. That's why. 
Um, okay. Oh, right. So Dan Coles. Um, yeah. And with their injuries to people like uh, to Gareth Evans, um, uh, Princip as well. Look, they're um, again having to go with um, Blonders, Karifi, and Sevilla um, in those in that uh, in what I think is a fairly unbalanced uh, loose trio. Um, Murphy Taramite. Wow, there's a name on the bench that we've uh, um, as, as 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 well that uh, we've not heard for a while. Um, yeah, I'm. There's there's a, a, a obviously with Jordy Barrett's boot uh, with the wind at his back. Uh, they're going to be able to, uh, for, for one half, they'll be able to clear themselves from their line very easily. For the other half, um, I just don't see where the carrying is. Um, okay, you're going to say Ardi Surveyor, Lau Mappi. If you, can if you can contain those two guys, you're going to really contain this hurricane side um, in their own half for, 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 for one of the halves when they're playing into the wind, I think. Steve, you 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 concerned about the the Hurricanes being a different team with uh, Jordi Jordi Barrett back and Audi Sevilla? Obviously, we've been saying he's out of form. He's not, you know, the player was, but he's, he's slowly but surely he's getting there. I mean, we're halfway into into this tournament. Um, do you, do you fear anything from from the Hurricane side? I think the biggest thing to fear will be, like Paul said, uh, La Mape. He loves playing the Highlanders, and he seems to just lift. Uh, playing up against him. So he's going to be the man to watch. So uh, that midfield, Vincenzo's back again as well. So you got that Lamapo Aso, Lamape Aso connection, which has that, you know, really good uh, link together between the two of them. So that's going to be key up against Tomkinson and Thompson. So it, it's all the, you know, similar sounding names going through that middle patch as well. Um, yeah, big concerns there. I think from the Hurricanes side of things, no Dane Coles. He was the one, I think, that kind of, despite his erratic sort of, Oh, personality that he does have. He shut Piranara up last week on a number of occasions and told him to, to go away, gave him the big, you know, don't argue hand uh, to his teammate. He's not here this week. Piranara is straight out, flat out captain. That's, if you're a Hurricanes fan, a problem for me uh, because he's going to have that entitlement now to be the guy that talks to the ref. And where that's going to go down is going to be, uh, I think, a big decisive thing. If he gets his team in trouble by just being a dick, they're not going to help his team. I mean, it's not leadership, is it? It's just not leadership. When you've got a guy who's out there whinging and moaning and, and complaining and just being a, an irritant and, you know, getting scolded by the referee, that's not what you want from your leader at, at all. And Coles contained him last week, like I said, and that made a big, big difference. A number of occasions he told him to go away when the referee was talking to him and just stay out of the conversation. I think that kind of composed Piranara a little bit because he kind of got put in his place to just play the game. Old deal of the referee, Cole said, you know, you just play your game. That's not going to be this week. That's a, that's a big concern if they don't get that leadership from them, uh, from, from the captain. So, yeah, that's it. I mean, Highlanders side, if you want to flip it over, annoy the hell out of him. Be an absolute prick to Piranara. Hit him like late. Ruffle him in the rucks. You know, just get under his skin because he is... Oh, he is the guy in that Hurricanes team. That culture is based around him and his personality. If you can just get under him, he, he's gonna he's just going to get rattled. And if they can do that, that's just going to go a long way towards putting your team in, in the driver's seat of this match. And I mean, and the smith Perinara battle as it is, is enough. So expect some fireworks there. And this bench, I mean, what's uh, you, you've, you've, um, with um, Fletcher Smith back uh, at 10, which is, which is an interesting choice. Um, no garden bash on the bench. So again, you're still having TJ Piranara switching to oh, 10 yeah. for the last 15, 20 minutes. I mean, what is, yeah, the, I, I really don't understand what the, um, what the coaches are doing there. Some, some, some weird selections. Uh, Billy Proctor will come on, throw a, throw a stupid offload and um, give the Highlanders a late try to, to win this one. Sounds great. Nice. I love that. We'll, uh, we'll send this uh, post podcast to Tony Brown so that um, they know exactly what the strategy is Steve wants there. Just irritate the crap out of TJ Perinora. That's that's the way to go. Okay, guys, let's get to the favorite part and, and let's hit the predictions. Um, or maybe let's let's do the Aussies first. Uh, Rebels, Reds, there. I'm going to be going for... I've gone for half-time, full-time Reds and Rebels there because I think it could go either way. But uh, Rebels to win by two. Um, Steve, then Paul. Well, I'm Ribbon. going completely against you there. I've gone for the Reds to get the job done. I'm, I'm backing my boys for the second week in a row. Reds by four. Bring me home some more cookies, boys. Rebels by three. It's, it's, okay. it's look, it's Brumbies Rebels final. Oh. 
Um, then on to the on to the the Tars, the Tars. Yeah, I don't know how much is going to be enough. I'm going to say Waratahs to win this one by 22. Steve, <laughs> wow, that's that's a big scoreline. I mean, this this is a hidden harder, isn't it? Like Paul alluded to earlier in the piece. My heart really, oh, how much I would enjoy the force just getting one over the Waratahs. It would be so, so sweet in more ways than than one. You know, that, that's from this side of the Tasman, way down here at the bottom of the country. Imagine Western Australia. Oh, that place will just explode. There'll be just like humans just imploding in themselves because the, the force have done the job against you know, the Waratahs who they detest over there as well. So that would be massive. I don't see it happening, though. Um, I'm going Waratahs by five. <laughs> Uh, by three. Uh, I just have to tell you guys, you got to remember how difficult that was for me because uh, Michael Hooper is like one of those guys we put on lampposts, yeah, and you throw eggs at them. You know, he's, <laughs> he's definitely not, uh, we're not keen on him. Um, going going on to the New Zealand games, let's, uh, actually, let's leave the Crusaders one for last. So let's hit the Islanders, Hurricanes. Okay, maybe I'll go last. I want to, no, I'm joking. No, I'm going to go for the, the Islanders to, to sneak, a, sneak a win. Yeah, I'm actually thinking they can do the business this week. Islanders by uh, three points. Drop goal. Oh, yes. I, I, I love your work. I do love your work indeed. I'm, I'm staying true to the boys as well. Highlanders to dig deep and pull this one out from the fire. Four points to the Southern men for me. Yeah, Highlanders by three for me. They're definitely the... the um, there's, there's, there's two teams at the top. There's a team in the middle and there's two teams at the bottom. And this is the team middle, so yeah, they you've got to go for the uh, uh the, the, the Highlanders. Yeah, that was a good copy copy paste there from the boys. That's an <laughs> interesting one. Although I gotta gotta let let the Panthers know there's some value on offer there since the Hurricanes are actually favourite in that one. Um, going into the last game, this is the big one. Everyone says it's 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 the final or at least the prelim to what we're going to see later in deciding the competition. Uh, Blues Crusaders, oh, yeah, Crusaders Blues. I'm going to go for the Crusaders to win this one by um, uh, right on the handicap, seven points. Well, you're not going to see uh, the Blues Crusaders final as Paul's probably itching to speed out as well because it won't be a final. It's round robin. So this is this is pretty much like a final, isn't it? You win this one, uh, you got, I mean, you could say one hand on the trophy, couldn't you? Bonus points if it goes the other way on the return leg. But it's it's big game. Regardless what way you swing it, what way you put it, this is like a final. Uh, home side Crusaders, two good Crusaders. Blues have lost their head. Uh, Leo McDonald is a crazy man. I didn't like him as a player. I don't like him as a coach. He can go away, but as long as he stays in Auckland, that's fine because they can just fail away their Crusaders by eight. Um, you, uh, you got well. Actually, you got to say the Crusaders have got their fingertips on the on the, to the, the uh, trophy already because they've got two bonus points, whereas the Blues haven't got any. Um, so already the the, the, the Crusaders have got their, their fingertips on it. I'm expecting these two sides probably to split the games home and away. Um, and so yeah, Crusaders by three on this one um, for me. Uh, and yeah, and yeah, it's it's yeah, the Crusaders are uh, are slowly getting a bigger, a firmer grip on that on that trophy. Just just the quick one, guys. Do do they replicate the same the same formation again? So will it be the final game of the season, um, being being the Blues and and the Crusaders, or do they mix it mix it up when they go to the second phase? That's a really, really good question. Just let me think about it for a second. And I can say, yes, it is completely mirrored the other side. So Blues are home, Eden Park, and, and week 10 is the fixture. Yes, you're right. Uh, I'm, I'm getting my final, so there we go. <laughs> there's, there's, there's one thing we didn't touch on from last week. We had our first red card. Um, but unfortunately, it was within 15 was minutes of the uh, end of the game, I think it was. So, so we didn't get a replacement on. So we, we nearly, nearly got... Um, that 20 minute replacement thing, but not quite. Now it's uh, we, we, time. We we might we might get it this week when um uh, the Islanders enforce Steve's plan and, and after 28 minutes it uh hit uh, TJ with a knee to the to the head. So that's gonna be uh, a bit of a concern. <laughs> Book yeah. it in, put a bit on it. Yeah, TJ Reed card. I'll actually I've I've got two two interesting interesting bets this week. I'm going to look for something on a on a red card for the Highlanders, and uh, secondly, I'm going short short on the amount of time it's going to take for Leon McDonald to pull out the shepherd's hook on on Plummer. <laughs> oh, 100 percent agree on that one. I yeah, I, I find it really weird. I find, like I said earlier, Plummer's a guy who's going to drop his head. I reckon if things don't go his way. Uh, as he, you know, he misses conversions when he gets a little bit rattled. Uh, we've seen it last season. I'm pretty sure with the Blues, 
when they had all those catastrophic injuries, you know, to Peter Feta, who's, who's injured again, unsurprisingly. Um, yeah, and, and he come on and he, he'd start good. Something goes wrong. It just flows on, snowballs. And is it, has he grown up? Has, has he matured mentally or not? I guess we'll see. Yeah, look, it, we, we didn't see him play that way at Minor 10 Cup. He was very composed at Minor 10 Cup, mm. uh, but seemed to lose it when he got to um, the, uh, the, the the big game or the the, you know, the big stage last year. As you say, ha has he uh, yeah, has he got better better composure now? We'll have to wait and see. He is a young player. Look, he's only into his like this is this, his full sec second season um, at Super Rugby level. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of I mean that's a, a very young back line when you think that Rico Iwani is a senior player <laughs> amongst them um, because you've got yeah Harry Plummer's what in his second season, Caleb Clark um, again second season, and um, Talia his first season, first full season. So yeah, a really inexperienced back line, um, but um, really exciting if they do decide to spin it. Well, guys, I think that's a, a superb way to end this uh, this show in round five. The big question is, will we see the the plumber crack? Uh, thanks so much for for joining me for this one, and uh, it was great as always. Cheers, gents. Cheers.